So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is released. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 today, we are continuing our study of Paul's letter to the saints in Thessalonica. That would be God's people in Thessalonica. I just want to make sure that we don't confuse what the word saints mean. It just means God's people who love him and have been declared innocent of their sins because Jesus Christ has given his life for them. He has risen from the dead to demonstrate that the payment for their sins was efficacious and they have received him through faith and the payment that he made through faith. If you haven't done that, you can become a saint by trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You can be one of those that God has set apart. The word saint just means holy one. Holy just means set apart for God. That's, that's it. Righteous is when you apply that holiness to your life. We sometimes think that holy means to live a life um, that is congruent with God. No, that just means being set apart from God. Righteous is what it is to live a life, to act out a life that is set apart from God, to live congruent with that call and purpose. You're in line with it as you go forward. So the letter which Paul wrote to the Thessalonians was written very early in his ministry. Most people dated about 50 AD. It seems like it is... Uh, that's a good time frame. It's right in there if it isn't exactly 50 AD. It's Paul's first letter. So there's some things in the letter that are a little bit jarring. We'll hit one of those again today because he had ways of expressing himself when he first began to communicate that he later on changed in his other letters because the church was maturing and growing and there were different ways of saying things as time went on. I'll talk about just one of those today. As we look at the section of scripture today, the Apostle Paul is looking at the people who live in Thessalonica and he is saying to them, that his deep desire to connect to them comes from a relationship that Jesus Christ has built in the short period of time that they were together. They may, not, they may have only been together about three months when he first led them into the kingdom. And then he had to leave because there was this big uproar. They were dragged before the city elders, not Paul actually, but the leaders of the church in Thessalonica after several months were dragged before the, the magistrates in Thessalonica. Jason was dragged. He had to post bond and probably as a part of posting that bond, he was told, you have to get rid of those troublemakers. And if they come back, you're forfeiting that bond. And I, that's important background information because today Paul will make mention of the fact that he really couldn't go back there even though he wanted to. And so we will get into that in just a few minutes. But today I've entitled this message, Building a Crown of Glory, because that's what the Apostle Paul discusses, the relationships that he was building. It's like building a crown of glory. So let's learn more about that today because we're going to learn, well, if Paul could build a crown of glory for when he stood before the Lord Jesus, we can too. And so let's look at how we can build those crowns. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, today we are in verses 13 to 20. Um, the Apostle Paul talks about this crown of glory, but um, reminder, as we go to the translation, I want you to remember, if you've, if you've been here a while, if you're a first-time visitor, um, the translation which you're going to see is my translation from the Greek language. I have the credentials to do that, and I am, I, I'm doing it because it's an enriching process for me. It also helps me live the text a little bit more and understand it at a much higher level than when I normally don't do that. So for its, I, I want to, you to have your Bible translation open in front of you, your favorite one, whether it's the NIV or the ESV or the NASB or the KJV or the new KJV, whatever. I mean, whatever it is, but it's great to have your own Bible translation open in front of you so you can see the differences and the nuances that each translator brings to a particular version of the Bible. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the Apostle Paul, who has been speaking his heart 
over those in Thessalonica, says, we also continuously give thanks to God because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also is releasing divine energy in you who believe. Okay, so Paul starts out this section that we're looking at with thanksgiving again. When we studied the book of Ephesians, you saw Paul giving thanks. When we started Thessalonians, we see Paul giving thanks. Paul would always talk about how much thanksgiving he had in, in his heart because of what God was doing among the people. And here he says, we continuously give thanks for you. There was a continued thanksgiving because he would think about the things that the Thessalonians were involved in. The specific thing that he remembered that he brings up right now is how the Thessalonians received his teaching. I mean, you can understand, Paul went to, Paul spoke in Athens. And he had spoken in Athens before he wrote this letter. And when he spoke in Athens, they kind of looked at him like he had some new philosophy. Very few people, some believe, but very few people responded to the gospel in Athens. Paul understood rejection. He understood when the soil of the people's hearts was hard and he was unable to penetrate. Same message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people will say, well, Paul didn't preach the right message in Athens. In the book of Acts, we are only given a little slice of some of the things that Paul said. And to say that he preached the wrong message is less than gracious toward the apostle Paul. And it's an argument from silence, which is not logical or intellectually sound. So to say that Paul's message was wrong in Athens well, it's inappropriate. Okay, so when people say that, it, it wasn't Paul's message. It was what was going on around him in Athens. Their hearts weren't ready. And so Paul, after leaving Athens, thinks, man, when we were in Thessalonica, those people, their hearts were ready. And he was thanking God for the fact that so much had happened. They received it. They received Paul's teaching. And he said, by the way, you received the word of God that you heard from us. He was speaking about his preaching. He wasn't talking about the Bible. He says, we are preaching the word of God to you. And he says, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it truly is the word of God. Now, that's Paul's confidence in his own message. That's pretty powerful. Because he's going, guys, I came to you and I preached, but I preached and it wasn't my message. It was God's message. It was his word, and that gives it tremendous power. That's interesting, and that's what he says. He says that word of God is also releasing divine energy in you who believe. You know, it's called the foolishness of preaching. But Paul makes it very clear right here that when God's word is preached, when it is taught, it releases divine energy in people. Now, I know a lot of your translations don't translate that as divine energy. Don't translate that word energeo as divine energy. I just said the word and many of you went, oh, that's the same word in 1 Corinthians 12, 6. Just humor me and say, yes, oh, yes, that's exactly what I thought about. Totally. Okay. And... Uh, <laughs> Because in 1 Corinthians 12, 6, it says, hey, well, in four, verse 4, it says, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts, Jesus provides the ministry opportunities, and the Father releases the energy. So whenever I teach about spiritual gifts, I point out, hey, that word that is translated energy there is a Greek word which only speaks about supernatural energy, either from the good side or the bad side. So I translated it in a way today that would demonstrate that it's talking about a divine energy, an energy that comes from the supernatural realm. And your translations don't translate it that way simply because of the fact that it's a little bit more awkward to say it that way. And I can translate it that way because I can explain why I translated it that way. It's not just talking about energy. God's word works in you. No, it releases divine energy in you. And that divine energy changes everything. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 
verses 17 to 19. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, might give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge of him, that he might enlighten the eyes of your heart so that you know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is his exceedingly great power in us who have believed. See, we don't believe that God has exceedingly great power working in us all of the time. In Romans 8, it says that the same resurrection power that rose Jesus, worked Jesus from the dead is at work in our mortal bodies. Now, that spe specific application, he says in the very next verse, therefore we have an obligation. It's not to our sin nature to serve it. The power which is at work in us gives us the ability to say no to the temptations of this world and to be able to work for the Lord. We are not on our own. His divine energy is working in us, changing us. And as we are set apart more for him, it changes us so that we can see into his realm at a much higher level. That divine, it's divine energy working in us. When we speak the word of God, when we read the word of God, there is a release of divine energy to truly accomplish the very things which are written or spoken on the page. Remember, when someone is using their teaching gift to share God's word with you, what happens is that the Holy Spirit has given that gift. The Father has given the opportunity to share the gift, or the, Jesus has given the opportunity to share the gift, and the Father is releasing his divine energy through the gift. Just another way of saying the same thing. If you come into a setting where the word of God is being truly preached and you don't understand there is power being released in the room, you're missing what is really going on in the heavenly realms and in you. you got to have faith for change. Sometimes you hear things and you say, man, I'm just not there. Oh, you will be. Because the very power that you need to affect the change so that you get to where you need to be is what the Father is releasing through the things that are being said. It's his divine energy which is being released in you even as we come together, which is why it's such a problem is we absent ourselves because we are not putting ourselves into a position where the spiritual gifts that God has given are able to release that divine energy in us. We say, well, I'm okay. I don't have to be around God's people. Well, that's not what the Word of God says. You, don't, you want that divine energy working in you? Oh, I can get that divine energy by reading the Word. Can you really? Can you really? I mean, do you really have that gift? Do you have the ability to discern what the Word of God says? Or do you need a teaching gift? Or are you just so bound up in pride you think you don't need other people? God gives grace to the huh, humble. I have a need to be around the people of God. I have a need to hear. I have a need to grow. I have a need to hear what others have to say. And I need their gifts at work in my life. And I'm talking, I'm talking personally now. And we all have that same need. And if we think we're an island unto ourselves, we are filled with pride. And God's word says something like about, ah, God opposes the proud. Ooh, 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 I don't want a opposition from God, do you? I want to have my heart opened up. I want his divine energy flowing through me at a very high level. So well, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians. You know, when you're writing about the, talking about the letter to the Ephesians, he's speaking to the Ephesians. However, he's not speaking... It's the people who lived in Thessalonica, and they are Thessalonians, and so sometimes I will trip over all of that. So anyway, <laughs> the divine energy is working in us. Paul goes on. He's continuously, he's thankful that they receive the word for what it is, the word of God. For you, brothers, and he's thankful for this too, pay attention. For you, brothers, became imitators of the assemblies of God in Judea that are in Christ Jesus, because you suffered in the same way from your own countrymen, just as they did from those in Judea. Now you know where the assemblies of God got their name. Okay. You said, you know, there, there were assemblies of God back then? Okay. 
For you, brothers, became imitators of the assemblies of God. Imitators, those who experience the same thing. That's what he's making reference to. You became just like them. And the assemblies uh, that he's talking about, remember we already talked about this. I translate, this word in your translations probably says church. Except it's clear that the Apostle Paul is not He's writing so early, the word had not come to mean the technical term yet. In Greek culture, the word ekklesia, which we translate church, just meant an assembly. And the assembly could be for political purposes. The assembly could be for all sorts of purposes. And so they were an assembly in Thessalonica that were in Jesus Christ. And we eventually call that a church. Later on, Paul calls that a church. I mean, he he doesn't say in Christ Jesus. He just assumes if you're a church, you're in Christ Jesus. So he drops that whole thing. But now he says, you became um, imitators of the assemblies of God in Judea. But he can't stop there. Because what kind of other assemblies of God were in Judea? Synagogues. Those were assemblies of God. Those were old covenant assemblies of God. And so we had to say the assemblies of God in Judea that are in Christ Jesus. And so they wanted to be very specific. It's an awkward phrase, and he did it. He had to put it that way so everyone understood all the assemblies in Judea, not the synagogues that are old covenant, but the new covenant assemblies that had gathered together. Okay, that's probably more information you wanted to know, but hey... It's because it was written so early. It was his first letter. It was 50 AD. I mean, this was one of the first scriptural things that went out. There was some early gospel writings, but it took, remember, Jesus was crucified in 33 AD, and it took a time for the things to be assembled and to get disseminated. And so this letter was one of the first things that people often saw when they came to Christ. So you became imitators of the assemblies of God that are in Christ Jesus in Judea because you suffered in the same way that they did. How did they suffer? Well, they suffered at the hands of their countrymen, and guess what? You suffered at the hands of your countrymen, too. You suffered in the same way from your own countrymen. That means, and we know the congregation in Thessalonica was pretty much just a, a Gentile congregation. It had some Jewish people, but the predominant flavor of the congregation was that it was Gentile. And they were being opposed. After Paul left, the persecution didn't stop. They were being opposed by their fellow countrymen. In the book of Hebrews, it actually says that there were believers in that realm who, were being, who their, their goods were being plundered that there was plundering going on. And so we don't know where that was happening. It certainly could have been happening in Thessalonica because they were being reacted against. This new faith was being reacted against. The people didn't like it, and so they could have been doing some major persecution. Paul makes it sound like there was major opposition to the message of the gospel in Thessalonica that these people had to be able to get through. How do we know that? He says it right here. You suffered in the same way from your own countrymen, just like the people in Judea. What did the people in Judea suffer? Well, they suffered the loss of their jobs, the loss of their income. They had to have the uh, deacons. We came to know them as deacons doing a distribution of food to the widows because there was nothing else available. When there was a famine, they took up around the rest of the Roman world, they took up an offering for them because the economic situation was so bad because they had been ostracized by their culture. There was a persecution against them that actually had people ended up in prison, dragged to prison, and people ended up dead as a result of the persecution which was released against them, which, by the way, Paul led. You know, Saul, guy when he was still Saul. And so there, there was, you know, this major opposition. He says, well, you guys got to imitate what was going on down in Judea. You got to suffer for the Lord in the same way. And he's thanking them, that they be, he's thanking God because they became imitators who did not lose their faith in the face of this severe persecution. It also lets you know why he was so concerned about them, why he wanted to get a report, because they were going through it, and it was a very difficult time for them. And I've already mentioned the churches of the assemblies in Christ Jesus that are there because of the fact that they needed to know just which assemblies were being talked about. And then he says at the end, he says, you know what? You suffered it the same way from your own countrymen just as they did from those in Judea. A lot of your translations have at the hands of the Jews or from the Jews. 
Now, the problem with that is that Paul and the Christians were Jews, and they weren't doing any suffering. The Thessalonians were suffering at the hands of their own countrymen, and the people in Judea were suffering at the hands of their own countrymen. The only way that you can translate that, and by the way, the word Judean, which is translated Jews by the translations, can mean Jew or it can mean those who live in Judea. And so there's no doubt that the Apostle Paul is saying, you suffered from your own countrymen, they suffered from their own countrymen. Who were their own countrymen? The ones who lived around them in Judea. And so in order to have a little bit of a like context, you say, the residents around you persecuted you, the residents around them persecuted them. They weren't persecuted by all the Jewish people. They were only persecuted by those who lived in the environs of Judea. And so to make the translation equal, to make it contextual, you translate it those in Judea. By the way, it's uh, very important for us as we translate the word of God, Satan has used the word of God to stir up anti-Semitism against the Jewish people. It's just the way it is. There is a horrible translation in the next verse in some translations which have been used. I'm saying horrible because it's been misused. It's not horrible because it had any nefarious intent. It just could be misunderstood and misused. And as a result, when we translate, we have to say, what's really being said and how can we translate better so that those with an evil heart can't misuse it in an anti-Semitic way to come against people? Because people with evil hearts will even use the scriptures to beat the daylights out of people. So... Paul says, you suffered in the same way from your own countrymen just as they did from those in Judea. You notice there's no punctuation at the end of this because this is not the end of the sentence. The end of the sentence comes from the next verse. But let's say, just as they did from those in Judea. Let's find out more about those in Judea. Wow, those are the ones who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us severely. They are not pleasing God and are a hindrance to everyone when they prevent us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. So Paul very clearly says, there's a group down there that's a problem. (laughs) And, you know, I mean, Paul ran into them, and Paul was one of them for a season, so he knew them by name, even. The ones who were stirring things up against the people. He had been among the high priests, the chief priests, the ones who stirred up all this persecution. And so this group... Well, who are they? They killed Jesus, they killed the prophets, and they persecuted Paul. He had had you know, opposition coming against him, and he had to be sent away because of the opposition which was being sent, you know, sent against him. By the way, um, it, it's very clear that we're, when you look at they are not pleasing God, some of your translations, the NIV doesn't make this mistake, but some of your translations um, do something which is a little that it's really problematic because it says they make the uh it says they are not pleasing to god as if it's an identity issue instead of an action issue paul's talking about actions and the translation you just need to drop the two the niv did and it's it's the verb requires that you drop the two And so it is, they are not pleasing God. What is it that they're doing that isn't pleasing God? The actions that are mentioned is that they don't please God um, and that they are a hindrance. That's what's not, okay, there's actions mentioned that they are involved in. What are the things that are not pleasing God? What are the things that are not, or that are a hindrance? It's when they prevent us speaking to the Gentiles so that they might also be saved. He's identifying actions, not identity. And that's important. Now, you may say, well, you know, it's never bothered me before. You're not Jewish. If you're Jewish, I can tell you, you look at this scripture and say, that's anti-Semitic. That is telling people to, that I displease God because I'm Jewish as a person, that my very existence displeases God. And that's just not true. You know, the gift and call of God are still irre- irrevocable. I've already told you. We already know that, that we are coming into an age where there's some great things that are going to happen among the Jewish people. God's heart has always been for the Jewish people. Now, there are activities that Paul's compatriots were involved in that certainly were not pleasing to God. Jesus said the same thing. He says, you know, fill up. 
the, the, the cup uh, because you're opposing God's plan right now to the leaders, the religious leaders, the same group that the Apostle Paul is talking about. So when Paul is talking about this, he's talking about, hey, there's some actions that the, these leaders in Judea are involved in that are not very helpful. They are not pleasing God because of the fact that they prevent us from speaking to the Gentiles and they end up being a hindrance to everyone because we can't speak to the Gentiles. And Paul's heart was, because, was uh, you know, Paul's heart was that he wanted to share the gospel with everyone. By the way, was it their fault that the Gentiles aren't saved in that area? And if you answer, oh, that's a trick question. No. No one has any excuse. Yeah, this is just the way it is. When we respond correctly to creation, this is Romans 1, God will make sure he gets the message of salvation to us. When our hearts respond correctly to the word that is preached throughout creation. Psalm, uh, Romans chapter 1 says that, Psalm 19 says that, the glory of God is proclaimed throughout the creation. And when we respond correctly to that and to our conscience, that's Romans 2, God will make sure he gets the message to us. If someone doesn't get the message, it's because of the fact that they have had a response in their hearts toward creation and conscience, which is not congruent to more revelation. Anybody that responds correctly to the revelation that they have will get more revelation. Why do you think, and this is happening in the Islamic world, in a big way, Jesus is showing up in dreams and visions. To imams, to people throughout the 1040 window, it's because there are no missionaries that can get to them, so guess what he has to do? You're going to stop my missionaries from coming in? That's okay. Who really needs a missionary by you? Now, by the way, we have the privilege of being his vocal cords. We have the privilege of being his feet. We have been called to go out to the nations, but sometimes we just can't get into places for obvious reasons. Missionary death toll is too high. And so Jesus shows up in person in the same way that he showed up to Paul. Not Paul wasn't responding correctly to truth. He was killing people. But he was called to be an apostle and he was heading the wrong direction and Jesus stepped up and knocked the blinders off of his eyes and says, man, are you messed up? And Paul says, boy, am I messed up and recognizes that he had been headed in the wrong direction even though he had the call of God in his life to be an apostle. But if someone responds correctly to the message of creation and conscience, they will get a revelation of Jesus Christ. And it, nothing can hinder it. If we choose not to preach the gospel, that doesn't stop people from being saved. You are not responsible for the salvation of other people. You are responsible for obeying Jesus Christ who has given us the privilege of calling other people to his side. And if we won't preach the gospel, he says, I'll just take that and give it to someone else. I'll take it away from you and give it to someone else who produced the fruit. That's what those scriptures are about. So, did the Jewish people stop the Gentiles from being saved? No. However, they were responsible for their activities. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. These Jewish leaders who were opposing, who lived in Judea. Paul says, hey, there's a problem. They aren't pleasing God right now when they do this. And they are a hindrance to us being able to get the message to the Gentiles. And here's the result in verse 16, the second half. The result is that they heap up their sin each time they do this. And the end time wrath has already drawn near them. Uh, get your theological hats on. The uh, result of their actions. There's two results. We'll get to the next one in the next verse. The result is that they heap up their sin each time they do this. There's two, there's two separate groups of results. The result is that they heap up their sin each time they do this. Heaping up sin versus repentance. Here's, here's what, you know, you get the picture when you repent of your sin, your sin is swept away. It's covered. It's drowned in the sea of everlasting forgetfulness. It has disappeared. The heap of sin, there's no heap of sin next to you. 
To have a heap of sin next to you means eventually it's going to be called into account. That's not good. To have a heap of sin next to you isn't good. What it means when, when we as Christians come before Jesus and we say, hey, I, I repent of my sins, I want your forgiveness, that is gone. And we, if we stay close to the Lord, there's never any heap again. I mean, we still can have a heap, we're still saved, and we may have some consequences of reaping and sowing based upon the heap of sin that we have next to us. So it's always good for us to keep growing in the Lord so the heap stays real gone. Now, if you are God's people in Judea, who are God's people in Judea, who are living under the first covenant, you want it, that heap of sin. You don't want a heap of sin next to you either. And Paul says their mistake was that they were doing things that were not pleasing to God, so there was a heap that they could not get rid of. They kept on living in it. And that was going to come under account. Now, what kind of account? He says, each time they do this, I mean, they, they, it's just the heap just keeps piling up, and the end time wrath has already drawn near them. What's the end time wrath? By the way, it does say until the end. Some translations say until the full or until the end or until completion. The phrase is the same phrase that Jesus uses when he talks about the end times. And most of the translations don't catch it because they aren't students of history or they, they're just trying to figure it out. It's, it's talking about the wrath which is going to come at the end of their era. When was the end of their era? 70 A.D. Jesus said there's going to be some wrath released around 70 A.D. where the heap of sin is going to be dealt with. However, the Apostle Paul, as he's talking about this, says, hey, it's already started. In 49 AD, Claudius in Rome expelled all the Jewish people. And Paul saw that as a sign of what was already coming. Now, by the way, did he have the dates of when the Jerusalem thing would eventually happen in 70 AD? No. All he could look is at the signs of the times. And he said, what Claudius did is a sign of what's coming. He knew the Roman armies were going to surround Jerusalem. Jesus had said that in Luke 21. He was well aware of it. And when he looked at what Claudius had done, he says, oh my goodness. In 49 AD, Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. In 49 AD, there was a great massacre at the temple. And he looked at it and he says, that's already a sign of what's about to come. Because in 70 AD, there was a huge massacre. It wasn't just at the temple, it was throughout Jerusalem. And he says, look at this judgment, this end time judgment, this thing that's coming. It's coming like a, 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 an avalanche down the hill. It's already aimed. It's already coming. It's already near. He could see the end. He could say, oh, they're not pleasing God. Remember his heart for them in Romans 9 and 10? He says, if I, in 11, if I could give up my own salvation... For my countrymen. That was his heart. He took no joy in this. But he said, you need to understand. Just like the day in which we live. We need to understand. There is... A... <laughs> Be careful. <clears throat> I'm going to think through this before I say it. You say, that's really a good thing. This must not be in his notes. Oh, correct. At the end of that covenant, those who were charged with bearing the covenant, those who did not bear the covenant, covenant received wrath. Remember what wrath is. Wrath is just that reaping and sowing thing. It's the thing that has been put into the warp and woof of creation. It's not like God looks at you and says, I'm going to wrath you. No, no, no. Wrath is what happened when the, the, whole, human, the whole human enterprise fell into sin and God says, these are the consequences. The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Dying, you will die. And death was released into the world and all the consequences of sin. And at the end of an age, those who are charged with bearing his covenant, if they are no longer doing it, they're going to reap the wrath, and 70 AD shows us a bit what that wrath looks like. Who's been in charge of bearing the covenant for the last 2,000 years? The new covenant, I mean. Oh, that would be the Gentiles in the church. And if we're no longer salt and we're no longer light and we're no longer bearing the covenant, what can we expect after we see the first covenant? We can expect to see judgment 
on those that call themselves the church but have not been the light bearers that they need to be. We have to learn the lesson. Learn the lesson of the fig tree. In the same way it happened in the first transition between epochs, it will happen in this, translation, this transition between epochs. And the people who were rescued in the first transition were those who were of the first covenant who said, I'm going to become a partaker of what God is doing now and not oppose it. And the only way that we avoid that same thing is by stepping into what God is doing now, continuing to be light bearers because the old structure is going to be judged. The old structure that no longer has the glory of God in it because it has chosen to oppose what God is doing now in the shift of the kingdom which is going on. Which means the empty church is going to go down. You say, what's the empty church? It's not talking about people. I'm talking about glory. In the same way that the temple in Jerusalem saw the glory leave it before 70 AD. And by the way, read Josephus if you want to understand that they actually had reports of the glory leaving the temple before the destruction. In the same way, we're going to see more and more evidence that the glory is leaving the church of the Gentiles. in those churches that are not in the shift and recognizing that it's now kingdom time. That's a hard message, isn't it? It's the way it works between epoch shifts. A lot of the stuff that we take and say, you know, there's going to be great tribulation, there will be, always is between a kingdom shift but there are always those who thrive. Where were the people who were Jewish who were following Jesus and listening to what his word said? Where were they when Jerusalem was destroyed? They'd gotten out of Dodge. They had left because they understood the word. They understood. Well, now, some of them may have missed the sign. Jesus said, when you see... <laughs> this, is, this always makes me laugh. Because Jesus said, by the way, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, it's time to get out. So you're in Jerusalem looking out over the wall and say, yep, that's what Jesus said, but I have no way to get out. Can you imagine? A lot of Christians had left already. They saw the Roman armies, heard reports of them coming. They saw what was going on. They said, we're getting out of here because Jesus had said we're, it was coming into time of confrontation. And so they got out already. But some of them were like, oh, we still have time. And all of a sudden they got up one morning and there were the Roman armies around them. Remember, they did not have like satellite television. Here come the Roman armies. No, they got up and there were the Roman armies. You know, they all kind of fled to Jerusalem. And so they probably thought to themselves, oh my goodness, have I blown it. This is not good. And then one day a report came from Rome that an emperor had died. And so all of a sudden the army disappeared. And everyone celebrated, except for the Christians. They celebrated too, but they celebrated with their feet. Because they went, the sign was fulfilled. We got to get out of here. And they left. And the Roman army came back under Titus in a short period of time. And that's the disaster which came upon them in 70 AD. God's people who are bearing his glory can always trust that if we listen to what his spirit is saying and we read his word, we'll have more understanding and enlightenment. The people that first read the book of Luke and they saw, oh, you know, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, that needed to gel in them for a while. They needed to figure it out. Some of them would look at that and say, I wonder what that means. But by the time they needed to know what it meant, they knew what it meant. And Jesus provided a great deliverance for them. We're living in a time of shift. When you hear me say that, understand it's not always just happy stuff. We're, not, we're warriors. We're those who are going to release the love of Christ in many different ways. There's going to be opposition. And the opposition often comes from our own countrymen. In our circumstance, that's not our nation. That's ho those who... I mean, you already know there's a whole section of, section of Christendom who says that those who believe in the Holy Spirit, who are charismatic, shouldn't even be a part of the church. You are aware of that, are you not? 
There is a whole conference that said that already. Well-known speaker, if I mentioned his name, you'd know. Well-known theologians were there debating whether or not we're really Christians. Think about that. That's from your own countrymen. We need to be those who say, Lord, help, 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 but recognizing when that sort of thing is happening, there's a heap that's building. And it's not up to us to ask God to judge that heap. It's not our business. To their own master, they stand or fall. But there's a heap building every time they come against one of the people of God who are truly serving him and they understand and they see what the kingdom is. And they speak against it or they attack it in other ways. There's a heap building. I hope I said all that carefully enough. Probably not. So Paul said about them, he says, hey, the end time wrath has already drawn near them. You're going to start to see the things as it comes into fulfillment more and more. We're going to see the same thing. And I'm telling you in advance, I'm saying, guys, when you see the stuff that's going to happen, be aware of the fact that we're in a transition and the heaps are going to start to be judged. Make sure you don't have heaps. That sounds like some disease, doesn't it? Yeah, he's got the heaps. <laughs> ah, that's pretty good. Anyway, the heap of sin. Okay. <laughs> Make sure you don't have the heap of sin. That'll become code for the future. I'm among those who do not have a heap. Okay. Anyway. Verse 17. Now, Paul speaks about another result. There's a personal result of that opposition. This was the personal result. And the opposition wasn't just from the, his brothers and sisters in Judea. It was also, remember, he's talking about the countrymen of the Thessalonians who were also opposing them. He says, in a result of what they're doing, we brothers have felt orphaned by our separation from you for a short season of time in person, not in affection, but we eagerly desire to see you in person. He says this type of persecution has a real relational result. And he felt orphaned. That's the feelings that come together with separation. He's trying to communicate something in the same way that an orphan feels when their parents die and there's a feeling of isolation, a feeling of not connecting anymore in the same way with the world. Paul said that's how he felt. He was, it's kind of an odd expression and you have to kind of work with it in order to get there, but he felt the same way. He felt orphaned by their separation. He felt like he didn't connect in the same way anymore because he could not get near them, even though it's only been a short period of time. Remember, they were only there about three months. He was only in Berea for a short period of time before he went down to Athens, and then he ended up in Corinth from where he wrote this letter, and it wasn't a long period of time. It was probably less than six months between the last time he had seen him, but he was so eager to see them, he felt like he was isolated from them, and it had an impact on them. That's probably what the short season means, just less than six months, but he wanted to see them in person. They were separated, not in his affection. He's very clear about that, but in his person. You know, we have something, we have, we have FaceTime, we have conference calls. We can not only hear people's voices, we've been able to hear that for generations, but we've been able to, um, you know, have, now we have video conferencing. And so when someone is away, when my son's up in North Georgia, and so every once in a while we just get a chance to see him, not just hear him, but actually see him, which is really good. Because I'm, I'm able to say, oh, you know, I remember what my son looks like. Ah, I see he's growing a bit of a beard. See you for a shock the next time he sees me. <laughs> but the, <laughs> he's going to say something happened. But the, uh, you know, the, it's, it's wonderful, but it's not the same as being in person. Okay, it's just not the same. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I get a chance to talk. I get the chance to see him. It's not the same as being in person. All Paul had is letters. Okay? And he wanted to see them in person. He says, we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, wanted to come several times, but Satan blocked us. Ooh, ooh, Paul, an apostle. Paul has his heart to see him. He wanted to come see him. He, gave, he, took some, he, went, he wanted to go a couple different times. The, the expression is more, it's, it's, uh, your translations try to deal with this Greek expression in different ways because there's an intensity to it. It's not just, you know, I want to come once or twice. That's, that's a little too weak. And... Uh, I wanted to come again and again is a little bit too strong because it wasn't again and again. It was, you know, several times. 
But it's, it's, I wanted to come several times. I really set my heart on showing up at your side, and it didn't work. It was blocked. Who was the blocker? Satan. You know, all Satan means is adversary, right? When we say the enemy, we're really just saying Satan. The enemy, the enemy of our souls. That just means Satan, that's his name. Satan, the adversary, the enemy. And so Paul identifies him as Satan, the adversary, the enemy, and he points out that his, you know, Satan has a kingdom, and he can send his, can't use the word minions anymore because you think of those little yellow creatures. <laughs> he can send his agents to do things which prevent you from coming. What was it that probably prevented Paul from going up there? Um, every time he wanted to go, someone says, Jason's going to forfeit his bond and probably go to prison. Because he posted bond. And so Paul goes, Ugh. Satan was the one who made sure that that happened. You know, just when, when Jason was dragged in front of the magistrates, there's just that little phrase, he had to post bond. What were the terms? Because when you post bond, there's terms. What were the terms? Make sure these troublemakers never come back. That's all that had to be there. An afterthought by some clerk as he wrote up the details so that Paul wasn't able to come back personally into that city without causing havoc. I mean, maybe, Jason, you'll forfeit your entire business. That's the bond. You give, you're going to have to post a bond right now, but if he comes back, you're not going to only forfeit the bond. We're going to make sure we seize all your property. There's all sorts of ways that he could have been blocked. However Satan did it, Paul got blocked. And as a result, even though the Apostle Paul desired to see them, he could not go up there because he was blocked. Okay, verses 19 and 20. For who will be our hope, our joy, or crown of triumph in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming if it is not you? You are our glory and our joy. Building a crown of glory or a clown, crown of triumph. Not a clown. A crown, building a crown of glory. Who will be our hope, our joy, our, or the crown of triumph in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, if not you? Think about what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, I want to come into the presence of the Lord at his parousia. The Greek word is literally parousia, which means his coming, his present, his second coming. If you've never heard the Greek term before, or the term parousia, it's an English word now. It talks about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at his advent, his coming. And so Paul says, at his coming, when he comes, and I'm standing before him, I want my crown in place. What is my crown? My hope, my joy, my crown of glory, or my crown of triumph, showing the Lord that, Lord, I did something for you while I was on this earth. I had an impact on the people to whom you sent me, and here they are. Here are the ones that you have given me. Think about that. We like to think about crowns as gold or silver. And what the Apostle Paul says is the crowns are the relationships and the people that we've had an impact on for the sake of God's kingdom. You want to show up in front of the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ with a crown on your head of triumph, it will be the people that you impacted with the life of Jesus Christ in the world in with which we live. That is the crown that we will wear. Glory and joy will be in the people that we impacted. That's pretty cool. When Paul said this, he was looking at the Thessalonians and saying, when I'm standing before the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to look at you. And I'm going to say, Lord, aren't they beautiful? And the Lord's going to say, yes, they are. And it's going to be Paul's crown of glory. Maybe we do have real crowns in heaven that we put on our head, but if we do, it will be related. The size of the crown, the glory of the crown will be related to the number of people that we impacted in the world. That's pretty cool. So how do you want to build a crown of glory? It's pretty important to impact people. 
You know, don't get worried and say, but my sphere of influence is so small. You have no idea. You have no idea. That, what about that poor preacher that called that one? He had this great revival and only one person got saved. It was a pretty pitiful revival. But the person that got saved was Billy Graham. Now, you know, this is, this is a, a pyramid scheme that we're a part of. You do know this. Because everything you do goes in my account too. As I minister to you, everything that you minister to and who they touch after you goes in your account too when it's based upon the life that you've released into them. Some of you have so much you don't even, you don't even begin to understand. Because you're thinking, well, you know, I don't touch that many people. My sphere of influence isn't that big. It's not about the size of your sphere of influence. It's about are you being faithful in the sphere that you have? Because if you're being faithful in the sphere that you have, it means your crown's going to be pretty weighty. Because the Lord's going to make sure that you are touching people who touch people, who impact people. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he died, he thought everything was gone. It was all burned up. The people that... His, most of the people in the congregations he served had already rebelled against him. They had already left him behind. They'd already, the shifts had already happened in that, in, and things were just so in turmoil. It was like, remember, he wrote the letters in First and Second Timothy. It's toward the end of his life, and he's like, well, you know, so-and-so deserted me, and so-and-so deserted me. And the Apostle Paul probably got to the end of his life thinking, well, that didn't do much. And he by then probably forgot about those few letters that he had written those letters that have continued to bear fruit for the kingdom of God for thousands of years. And there's a pretty good bet that the Apostle Paul has more fruit than anyone else in the New Testament era as a result of those few letters that he wrote. Even though he died probably thinking he was a failure. His crown of glory is huge. Because we all belong in his account. Isn't that amazing? Building a crown of glory, using the gifts that you have to accomplish the purposes of the kingdom. And when you do that, there's no heap next to you. (laughs) Don't let that happen. And God's life is released through you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity today to be reminded once again of what the crowns of glory are all about in your presence. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, had such a heart to reach out to them. And he saw the opposition. He saw how Satan lined up the opposition. He knew he had been part of the opposition. (laughs) He knew by name the people in Judea who were opposing him because he had been them. And yet, Lord, his heart was to release life and grace at every turn. We ask that that would be our heart too as we continue to build the crown of glory that you've called us to build. In your name, Jesus, I pray.